Hello everyone and welcome back to Versus, the show that takes titans of artistic achievement and forces them to compete for our amusement. That's going to be a recurring theme today because we're featuring two of the most amusing forces planet Earth has ever witnessed, and just to heighten the tension and raise the stakes even more, our two stars are real-life BFFs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They tell jokes together, vacation together, and most recently investigate murders in their building with fellow tenant Selena Gomez. It's comedy legend Steve Martin taking on merriment maestro Martin Short right now on Versus. In one corner representing America, it's Martin. No, not that, was Steve Martin. This is gonna get confusing, isn't it? Steve Martin, the versatile funny man who acts, writes, and banjos his way all over the globe. Oh, and he happens to be arguably the biggest stand-up act in the history of the art form. My real name is, uh... <laughs> Just wait until you hear how big the arenas he sold out regularly were, although the term arena kind of puts you in that mind frame. In the other corner, fighting out of Canada, it's Martin Short, the versatile funny man who acts, sings, dances, and just might have the most pound-for-pound -pound laughs of any guest to ever appear on a late-night talk show. Oh, look at that. Oh, I, oh, oh. <laughs> Speaking of late night, these two have also had their fair share of live Saturday nights from New York. This is going to be a fun one, I must say. Oh, that certainly would be pleasant, I must say. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, iconic characters. Round four, late night. And then we'll do a wild card round that could be the tiebreaker between these two wild and crazy guys. Although that sketch featuring Steve Martin was with another Canadian, Dan Aykroyd, it's become so beloved over the years that it might be trademarked. So we'll stick with calling these buddies the Two Amigos, and I'm sure a nod to Chevy Chase will emerge at some point. Short and Martin, which now sounds like a law firm or an upscale men's clothing shop, actually hit it off while filming Three Amigos, and that 1986 gem would serve as a launching point for a friendship that is going stronger than ever, as evidenced by an ongoing tour starring the two, and the hit Hulu show Only Murders in the Building. Meanwhile, here on Versus, it's as competitive as it gets, but we're really just here to celebrate two legendary careers dedicated to making people laugh, and occasionally finding out who killed Tim Kono. If it's a tie after four rounds, maybe we call Selena Gomez to determine the winner. She's not available. It, it's all going to come down to me then, your host, Mark Ellis, Director of Sales, Shower Curtain Ring Division. I sell shower curtain rings. Best in the world. Let's get it on. Round one, box office. With two comedy superstars as beloved as Steve Martin and Martin Short, one would be correct in assuming that they've had their fair share of hit movies. Sure, Martin got his start in stand-up and happened to become the biggest in the world at it, and Short first rose to fame in sketch comedy and happened to star in arguably the two biggest sketch shows of all time, but Hollywood beckoned and these funny folks heeded the call. And while both have starred in plenty of films in their own right, it was Steve Martin leading the way in the father of the bride flicks with Martin Short supporting as a very zealous wedding planning Swiss Army knife. Even though I think he was French, right? So those two films combined to take in over $150 million worldwide. Three Amigos would add $39 million to each as total. Short and Martin, which still sounds odd, each did voices in the 1998 hit The Prince of Egypt as well, which would amass $218 million around the globe. For Martin Short, it's the voiceover work that keeps him treading water in this round. His turn in Madagascar 3 as Stefano helped that juggernaut churn out $746 million worth of business, and The Addams Family from 2019 tosses 200 mil more on the pile. Short's legendary Jack Frost in The Santa Claus 3 marks his best performing live action role as that movie crossed the $100 million line with 7 mil to spare. Mars Attacks and Jungle to Jungle also serve as credible hits for his resume in the mid-1990s. And now we look to Steve Martin who kicked off his movie stardom career back in 1979 with the Carl Reiner-directed hit, The Jerk. $73 million worldwide is a gaudy number in any era, and it would usher in a decade of hits, including such titles as Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and Roxanne, though they were all modest smashes. None crossed the $50 million line, but I give him credit for a memorable pop-in to the Muppet movie, which earned $76 million back in 1979. Excellent choice. Then a decade later, Parenthood exploded with a $126 million take, a harbinger of 1990s successes to come, like The Father of the Bride Flicks, House Sitter at $94 million, and Bowfinger at $98 million. 
Once again, it seemed Martin was on the precipice of another decade on top, or even a new millennium. Yeah, the 2000s saw Steve Martin make his biggest live-action splash at the box office ever, thanks to family hits like Bringing Down the House's $164 million total and franchises like Cheaper by the Dozen and The Pink Panthers. Dozens is team up for $325 million. The Panthers raked in a combined $228 million. Bucks. Good one. All told, Steve Martin's highest grossing movie ever, where we get to see him, is the 2009 hit It's Complicated, which brought in $224 million around the world. But because Martin's best animated film, Home, topped out at $385 million, could Martin Short steal round one from his good buddy? We got a chance. Short's career box office total is an impressive $2.4 billion, making for a per film average of $83 million every time we see or hear him on the big screen. Meanwhile, Steve Martin bests his bud with a $2.97 billion total haul, but his average is lower, resting at $68 million. I've got a lot to learn about handling my money and banks. Oh boy, couldn't one of these cats just pop into a Marvel or a Star Wars and make my job easier? I imagine these two good buddies are backstage somewhere watching this very vid, waiting to go on stage until I render a decision in this round. So if there's an audience waiting, I'll be brief. But first, may I use the restroom? Of course you may. Thank you. Steve Martin's resume rests more on his leading man status than Martin Short's does. Short is nothing, well, short of phenomenal in his starring roles like Clifford, Pure Luck, and Inner Space, but the box office take simply doesn't reflect that comedic genius like it does Steve Martin's. Martin's pivot into the more family-friendly fare beginning with Parenthood proves to be the determining factor here, so by the slimmest of margins, I'm giving the nod to him in round one. The Jerk, I hate calling him that because he seems like such a nice guy, wins this phase and goes up one to nothing. All right, boys, you can go on stage now. Have a great show, and if you need an opener next time, I know someone. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love to uh, discuss this with you further, but I'm expecting someone. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. And here we careen into round two, where the critics and audiences have their say after their wallets and purses got to shout in round one. Steve Martin narrowly won that round about who walked into the movie theater. Now we'll see who the throngs of admirers liked better on the way out. But I will say, I must say, say, that both gents are going to be sporting a ton of fresh fare here, worthy of their perch atop comedic Mount Olympus. Steve Martin, hot off a big win the previous round, now looks to keep his momentum going with a trio of classic flicks that sit in the 90s on the tomato meter. Parenthood is at 91%, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is at 92%, and Steve's best starring role output here is L.A. Story at 93% with a critic's consensus that reads, a romantic comedy that doubles as a love letter to the titular city, L.A. story is Steve Martin at his silly, sweetly soulful best. Is this a joke or something? Also getting into a four-year reputable university, according to Grades, is Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and Roxanne, both are at 88%, and All of Me's at 85%, and The Jerk keeps the rhythm, as best he can, at 83%. Martin Short's going to be competitive with his pal here in the tomato patch as he has the big picture and the wind rises both at 88% and the Willoughby's are at 91%. Interspace also scores big with an 82% and a critic's consensus that says a manic overstuffed blend of sci-fi, comedy, and romance, Interspace nonetheless charms thanks to Martin Short's fine performance and the insistent zaniness of the plot. Short's impeccable comedic voice pads his average with animated hits like Frankenweenie at 87%, The Spiderwick Chronicles at 81%, and Madagascar 3 is at 78%. For funsies, our dueling banjos teamed up for Father of the Bride, which is 70%, Father of the Bride 2 at 52%, and Three Amigos, oh, don't tell, is it rotten? It's rotten? Uh, it's 45%. Nanny! I'll take it. Comedy is a sport full of big swings and mythological home runs but also some strikeouts. For Martin Short, his talent was belied by poor critical responses to Pure Luck at 9% and Clifford at 13%. Meanwhile, Steve Martin's foray into All Ages Fair might have served him well in terms of box office, but it put him in the penalty box with some critics as Cheaper by the Dozen is at 24% and the sequel is the low mark for either actor at just 6%. Mixed Nuts could only season at 13%, which ties it with The Pink Panther 2. So it's a close call here, and we might need to see the audience score before determining a winner in this round. I don't care what anyone says, Jiminy Glick in La La Wood is hysterical, and it's a prosecutable crime that is only at 32% with you, 
the good people of Earth. And Baby Mama's only at 55%? That movie's hysterical, and Steve Martin steals every scene he's in. Luckily, y'all redeemed yourselves in Steve, Marty, and my eyes by making Three Amigos fresh on the audience score metric with 67%. The Three Amigos! <coughs> Coincidentally, that's also the score for Clifford and All of Me. And the highest ranking effort for either star with the crowds is a team win as Prince of Egypt is at 90%. All told, it's neck and neck here in round two. Martin Short's movie tomato meter average is a fresh 60% per film. His bud Steve Martin is just south at 53%. Steve gets closer to Freshtown with an audience score average of 58%, but Martin Short improves to 61% here. And yes, Martin Short's TV tomato meter is a 67% average compared to Martin's 100%, but that 100% is solely thanks to only murders in the building season two of which is currently underway as of this filming. Can't wait to see what the TM says about that. I'm only halfway through season one, as a matter of fact, but I'm pretty sure both of them are going to survive unless Sting gets really upset. Thus, Martin Short takes the victory here in round two, and all of a sudden we're tied one to one. Hey, that's great. Congratulations. Round three, iconic characters. And now a round that appears quite often on Versus, the most viewed competition show of all time in certain parts of Virginia. I think it's the best show on the air ever that has been. It's weird how good it is. It's so strange. But today, Iconic Characters seems as though it was custom made just for Steve Martin and Martin Short. Yes, their big screen exploits will obviously count here, but I'm also keeping an eye on their dozens of memorable sketch creations on the small screen. But enough preamble, if you've ever seen Steve Martin as Neil Page in planes, trains, and automobiles, then you know you probably shouldn't keep him waiting, especially for a rental car. I want a car right now. I'm told it's not ready yet, so we'll kick off with Martin Short. Gobble, gobble. In just one season as an SNL cast member, I can already hear my friends to the north yelling, what about SCTV? I'm just setting the table, we'll get to you. Short created Last Thing Last with folks like Nathan Thurm, a tobacco grower of America, and Ed Grimley, who I must say shared a few DNA strands with many of his prior creations from SCTV. The legendary, we're using that word a lot today, aren't we? Canadian sketch show that helped make a name for Martin Short, Catherine O'Hara, Eugene Levy, Rick Moranis, and John Candy, just to name a few. Legendary? I don't think so. I dare you right now to YouTube Jackie Rogers and keep a straight face. We get to see a young Martin Short swinging in the wilderness with disastrously hysterical results. I watched it again this morning. It's better than a strong cup of joe. You're just saying that to get a higher rating on your TV show. Scenes from An Idiot's Marriage, Half Wits, it was easy to see why Saturday Night Live so wanted Martin Short to come be an all-star, and it's a shame we only got him for one season there, but SCTV remains the gift that keeps on giving. I'm having some degree of difficulty getting through high school. Steve Martin not only inhabited great characters in his appearances hosting SNL, he provided some all-time musical bits in his 15 occurrences as the host. He's also popped in as a surprise many more times, and just one example of his unique brilliance is when he's making a simple Christmas wish list that includes that crap about the kids. But after retiring from stand-up comedy because, I'm checking my notes, he got too famous his big screen breakthrough came in the form of Navin Johnson, the supposed son of a family of black sharecroppers in The Jerk. His rhythmless dancing intimated that he might be headed on a different path than his adopted relatives. And just like Johnson, Martin had found his purpose in delighting audiences in movie theaters with starring roles like a well schnozzed fireman in Roxanne and cameos in such hits as Little Shop of Horrors, which is a hilarious scene unless you're like me and you actually had a dentist appointment later that day. Say, ah! Now spit! Planes, Trains, and Automobiles holds up as a holiday classic, not just because of Martin's comedic chemistry with John Candy, but also because of the emotional beats these two actors build together. Steve Martin can be hilarious dressing down Candy's Del Griffith, but then a few seconds later, we feel all the sympathy in the world for the big guy, and we just want these two to hug it out. Just make sure that when you wake up the next day, those are pillows before you get too comfy. Those aren't pillows. Ah! Ow! Ow! <laughs> Meanwhile, Martin Short's over-the-top pitch-perfect genius perfectly lent itself to inner space in which a tiny Dennis Quaid invades his body with knee-slapping results. Clifford is another brilliant display of Short's chops in a film far too few have seen. You think that Miss Sarah and Mr. Ellis perhaps would name their first child Martin? 
Marty displays more range in roles like Mars Attacks and Inherent Vice, where he plays a drugged up sleazeball infected by paranoia. Look, that movie is not an easy watch, except when Short is there because you just can't take your eyes off him. For all the greatness that Steve Martin shows in the family hits like Parenthood and Cheaper by the Dozen, he's still at his best when he has a comedy superstar to play off of. Hello, ladies. No, I'm not talking about you, Martin. I was thinking Eddie Murphy in Bowfinger. Martin is a Hollywood-adjacent B-movie director and acting teacher looking for a hit, so he wedges an unknowing star, Kit Ramsey, into a sci-fi movie. The result is a timeless classic whose laughs only seem to get bigger with each rewatch. If the ball game feels too close to call now, let's have a look at when these two have shared the screen, starting with the smaller one. No spoilers for me because I'm still in season one, but Only Murders in the Building is a wonderful series so far that nails the chemistry that Short and Martin have honed on stage during their touring show. And the two also share a perfect third companion with Selena Gomez. It's a compliment to all three that they can hang with the other two. When it comes to movies, it's usually Steve tolerating Martin as evidence in The Father of the Brides. Three Amigos will be a lasting film on the top of their ographies simply for the sweet little buttercup performance. I thought we were quite good in it. Good, we were cray. But because it was Martin that broke into film first and in such a dynamic way with The Jerk and then a string of films in the 1980s, I give him the slight edge in this round, maybe the most competitive yet, but it will be Steve Martin taking the iconic characters round and he regains the advantage two to one. Round four, Late Night. And now we arrive at a round that at first blush feels like another one that Steve Martin can easily take. Heck, ask anyone today, and they're pretty sure that Steve Martin was an original cast member of SNL simply because he was, and remains, such a mainstay of the almost 50-year history of the program. But let's not forget that Martin Short was a cast member, often pops in unannounced, and steals entire sketches, and is also a delight across the late night talk show circuit. After perfecting his own wild and crazy antics on stand-up stages, Martin teamed up with original SNL cast member Dan Aykroyd for just one of his many memorable roles on the show. We are two wild and crazy guys! The regular host momentum has carried Martin through the decades to the point where now it's a fun riff between him and Alec Baldwin as they compete for the title of most guest appearances in history. In an episode a few years back, an opening sketch saw Martin, Baldwin, and a few other luminaries like Paul Simon in an exclusive VIP room celebrating their achievement as Studio 8H Legacies. As they reminisce before an awestruck audience, a waiter happens by to take drink orders. Who was it? You guessed it, Martin Short. Sad. Yeah. His time on SNL was limited to just one year in the mid-1980s, though lore has it that Lauren Michaels desperately wanted Short to return with him to form a new core cast that would take the show into the 1990s. But film, TV, and the Broadway stage beckoned, so Short politely declined and would go on to become one of the great late-night talk show panelists of all time. In a short list that might also include Don Rickles, Rodney Dangerfield, Robin Williams, Martin has cemented himself as the perfect couch companion to a plethora of hosts throughout the ages. Everyone from Johnny Carson to Jimmy Fallon and David Letterman to Conan and Jimmy Kimmel. His lightning quick reflexes belie his desperate for approval shtick, making his appearances must-see TV, even when he's not necessarily there to promote anything. Oh, please. And now that Martin and Short are tethered together by a sold-out theater run and a hit streaming show, they often show up as a pair, or sometimes a trio, with Selena Gomez. In a recent episode of Jimmy Kimmel Live, it was Short and Gomez who warmed the couch, and then they opened a briefcase where a virtual Steve Martin was waiting via Zoom. Short playfully enjoyed absolute power over his dear friend, and as always, came equipped with topical jokes and self-deprecating uppercuts. Thank you so much! The two energies are so different, which is what makes such a potent elixir when they're together. Sure, Martin Short can play it straight and set his fellow performer up for a gag, and Steve Martin can harken back to his 1970s days anytime he wants to display an unrivaled burst of energy. But for all the many memories the both of them have made at 30 Rockefeller Center, the unmatched wit and timing of Martin Short when he's appearing anywhere after hours is a guaranteed good time. Much like the talk show host that he leaves in stitches, us the audience are laughing just as hard and as often often with him as with anyone who's ever been on those hallowed couches. No one can possibly replace Steve Martin as an SNL legend. He's a one-of-a-kind trick who so blends with the weekly insanity and delivers the Saturday night payoff as well as anyone ever has. But now it's Martin Short who continues to transcend generation gaps and make a new crop of talk show hosts gasp for air as he continues to spit out comedy gold at an unrivaled clip. Martin Short takes round four and we're all tied up at two to two as we head into a round custom made for 
for these two. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And now it's time for the wild card round, Legacy. What's amazing about Martin Short and Steve Martin's late night legend status is that's still just scraping the surface of their hilarity footprint that they've left. Each performer has been making us howl with laughter for so long, their combined lineage in the limelight would surpass a century's worth of joke telling. But whose legacy is richer when it all comes down to it? I ask that question mainly as one last desperate attempt to bat signal Selena Gomez so she can come in and do this round and I won't have to make a choice between Steve Martin and Martin Short. I feel like the mom at the end of The Good Son. Steve Martin began a career in entertainment just down the road from this very studio at Southern California's Knott's Berry Farm, where he'd perform self-taught magic tricks and pepper in an occasional joke. Then the stand-up comedy boom happened just as he was finding his footing as a writer for shows like The Smothers Brothers. As good as that day job was, there was something so freeing about being a solo act at nightclubs. Luckily for all of us, Steve Martin heeded that call. Martin Short attended university in Canada with plans to become a social worker, but after being cast in a local production, he decided to serve the people in a very different way. That production was Godspell, and also in that cast happened to be Gilda Radner, Eugene Levy, and Dave Thomas. And the musical director, you guessed it, longtime Letterman band leader Paul Schaefer. Imagine how tough a ticket to that show would be today. From those beginnings arose two mighty comedy legacies that are now intertwined. But if Martin Short was the victor in a late night TV round, it might be Steve Martin that has the advantage here. Why? Well, remember that stand-up thing he was gonna give a try? He happened to become arguably the biggest comedy act in the history of Earth, blending a kinetic style chock full of irreverent jokes and sarcastic wit, and adding in a dash of Andy Kaufman-like singularity, Steve Martin would go to tour arenas when comedy clubs were springing up across the country, when other comics were doing weekends at those clubs, he was selling out stadiums. His albums went platinum, and he was so big that the famed Blues Brothers opened for him at the Los Angeles Forum. Doing the arena where the Lakers play is challenging enough. Now imagine having to follow the musical comedy of John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. As he details in his brilliant biography, Born Standing Up, Steve Martin eventually got so famous that he couldn't go anywhere or do anything, lest he invoke a Beatles Hard Day's Night-like scenario on the city streets. The gigantic halls were the only places it was safe to perform, but he no longer felt like he was the groundbreaking comic that got him there. The audiences were too busy partying and yelling out beloved lines for him to generate any new material. The intimate comedy shows had given way to sing-along rock concerts, so Martin had to shift gears into the next phase of his career, film. Meanwhile, Martin Short was forming a groundbreaking sketch show called SCTV with some of his Godspell pals. Just like National Lampoon, Second City, and eventually SNL here in the States, SCTV marked the dawn of a new generation of comedy and with it a new delivery system. Hilarious sketches intertwined with gag advertisements and set pieces. If you watch any hit comedy from the 80s or 90s or even today, Vegas is going to give you good odds that it includes some SCTV fingerprints. <laughs> So it does only seem fitting that the stars aligned, literally, to bless us with Martin Short and Steve Martin performing together on tour, late night couches, and on our streaming devices. Their own individual legacies are so set in precious stone, thus the only way to forge ahead to higher ground is together. And while it's short that might be quicker on the draw by the design of their friendship, the advantage Steve Martin has is that no one ever matched him in terms of sheer rock star comedian status. Others have come close to selling that amount of tickets, but only Eddie Murphy could throw his hat in the ring for being that big for that long. Luckily, we also got to see them team up together in a film worthy of their talents with Bowfinger. I'm keeping it together. I'm K-I-T Kit. Keep it together. I'm keeping it together right now. Keep it together. Keep it together. Keep it together. Keep it together. I'm keeping it together. Steve Martin hasn't done traditional stand-up since his heyday, with one notable exception. A few years back, he lost a bet to his buddy Jerry Seinfeld. To honor the debt, Jerry mandated that Steve had to open for him at Carnegie Hall, a man of his word. The night came, the show was sold out, the lights went down, and a stunned crowd watched the man, the myth himself, walk out on the boards to tell some jokes. It was brief to be sure, but the ovation Steve Martin Martin received that night was like none other, a crowd lucky enough to witness the afterglow of a comet maybe never to be seen again. Steve Martin wins the legacy round and thus takes the match. And that, kids, is just about as close to an emotional crescendo as my cold, dead heart will allow. I play the same sport that Steve Martin did once upon a time, stand-up comedy, but the level to which his game rose remains unmatched. And now when I find myself back in the hotel room after performing for considerably less folks than Martin used to, I'll be channel surfing until I find a late night couch occupied by Martin Short, who reminds us just how funny he still is after all these years.
It was an impossible task today. I picked a winner and I hope everyone watching enjoys the positive spirit with which the job was done. I don't care if you agree with me, I might wake up tomorrow and change my mind. But I would like y'all to take your own walk down the hallowed halls of comedy greatness and take in some sketches, stand-up, films, books, or anything else that Martin Short and Steve Martin have delighted us with over the decades. Only Murders in the Building is actually a pretty good place to start. Make sure you keep it right here at Rotten Tomatoes for the latest in all things entertainment, and for my stand-up tour dates, you can head to markellis.live. Thanks for watching Versus, my sweet little buttercups. This wild and crazy guy had a great time, I must say.